grab in your seats, get your Bibles and open them to John chapter 3. That's going to be the first place that we go this morning. We're going to make several stops throughout uh, the scriptures to uh, talk about the spiritual discipline of making disciples, right? It is a discipline because it's going to require us to discipline ourselves to do it, and it's going to require us to uh, use great intentionality if we're going to actually make disciples. And it's one of the most important ones, and that's why I put it here at the end, because it is our number one job description, right? Of all the things in the Bible, this is the number one thing that Jesus told us to do. As great and as awesome as all the things that we do as part of a church, that's not actually what Jesus said to do. So Awanas and all these things, wonderful, wonderful ministries. But you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, go and make disciples, right? And so that's our number one job description as believers in Jesus Christ is to make disciples. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning, the spiritual discipline of making disciples and being a disciple maker, all right? And so here's a basic definition for you this morning to help guide our, our time together. This is, a, this is a definition that I came up with this week. This is my definition. If you have a little bit different one, that's, that's great. But here's what I'm defining as a disciple maker. A disciple maker is a believer in Christ that seeks to build relationships with others so they become disciples of Christ, right? So the idea is that if you are in relationship with Jesus, that you are a believer and you are seeking to form relationships with the people that God has placed in your life with the hopes that they one day would also come to saving faith and be followers of Jesus. That's the whole idea of being a disciple maker. But before we go any further, before we talk about being a disciple maker and how to make disciples, I thought it would be good for us this morning to just start with the basic question of what is a disciple? So before we talk about making more, let's talk about what a disciple is because uh, there's a lot of ideas out there, right? And so we want to clear some of those things up this morning. But in the, in the most general sense, disciple in the New Testament translates pupil or learner, all right? So it's a pupil or learner of a particular teacher, okay? So the idea of discipleship is not brand new in the New Testament with Jesus. In fact, it's very common in the first century for there to be teachers and rabbis that would have disciples, people that they would sometimes choose and sometimes the, the disciples would choose them, right? But they are pupils and learners of a particular teacher. And to just show you, in John chapter 3, John the baptizer was actually a teacher, and he had his own disciples. And so I want to share this with you because he makes, he makes an emphasis for us and a, and a little bit of a radical change. Because what John's going to tell us is, is you're, there are lots of disciples, right, and lots of disciple makers, but from this point on, now that the Christ has come, a disciple is going to be somebody who follows Jesus, right? And so let's talk about it for a second. John chapter 3, starting in verse 25. It says, now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. And so we see a, a major transition in the idea of what it means to be a disciple right here in John chapter 3. Because before it's like, listen, you're just a pupil and a learner of whatever that rabbi is that you're really close to, right? Or that guy that you want to follow. Even John himself had disciples and they come to him and they say, listen, this, this Jesus guy that you bore witness about, He's, he's starting to get his own disciples, right? Like people are starting to go after him. In fact, he's even baptizing. And what are, we, what are we supposed to understand about this? And John says, listen, you should follow after him. 
I've come to bear witness about Jesus and not myself. He must increase and I must decrease. So John begins to paint a picture for those of us in the room to understand that being a Christian disciple is not about just following someone. A Christian disciple is about following Jesus, right? And that's the major emphasis, and it's the first thing that you see on your hand out there. So when we answer the question, what is a disciple? Number one, a disciple is one who has personally decided to follow Jesus, right? It's no longer picking your, your favorite guy to follow after. We're all commanded to follow after Christ. We're all disciples of Jesus. But there's an emphasis here on personally decide, Right? Personally decide. This is what we see demonstrated throughout the New Testament. That Jesus shows up in the lives of, of his first disciples. We're going to see here in Matthew chapter 4 in just a second. And he offers an invitation. Or he, he extends an invitation to them to follow after him and be his disciples. And we're going to see how these guys respond. So look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. It says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee... He saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, they, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. So they personally decided and responded to follow after Christ. Verse 20, or 21, excuse me. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. And so why is this so important? In order for us to understand what a disciple is and whether or not we are a disciple, we have to start here. That there's a personal decision that's been made to follow after Christ. Just like these original disciples, an invitation has been extended to all of you here in the room. That you can decide personally about, right? Are you going to follow after Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he is who he says he is? And are you going to commit your life to doing that? It's not just a simple asking Jesus into your heart. It's a lordship issue, right? We've talked about that a couple weeks ago, that you are deciding to follow after. And there is no one foot in and one foot out. You're not going to follow Jesus some, right? To, to decide to be a disciple of somebody means that not only do you follow after him, but you're going 100%. What they do, you do. What they say, you say. The things that they command to do, you, you're all about those things, right? And so that's the idea and picture here when we talk about a disciple. It's a person who has decided to follow Jesus on a personal level, right? So why does this matter? Why is this important for us, all right? So a couple of things. Number one is this. If we're going to make disciples of Jesus Christ, we must first be a disciple of Jesus Christ, right? You're not going to be very effective at making disciples and going and getting more guys or gals to, to follow after Jesus if you yourself aren't a follower of Christ, right? We see this pattern all throughout the New Testament. What happens? Jesus shows up. He gives an invitation to guys like this. He says some crazy stuff like you're now going to fish men, and they're like, okay, let's go. Uh, it's crazy, their obedience, right? And so they just, they just start following Jesus. But, but we have example after example in Scripture of as soon as they start to follow Jesus, what do they do? They go get other people, right? And they go, hey, listen, you, you've got to see what, what we're seeing. You've got to meet this man who's, who's changed my life. You, you've, got to, you've got to come and follow after him like I'm following after him, right? And so you see this example, but you can't make disciples if you're not one yourself, so you have to personally decide to follow Jesus. Second thing on here is that everyone that follows Jesus is a disciple. Everyone that follows Jesus is a disciple, all right? This is not a special group of men. It's not uh, just for the serious Christians, but not for all of us. We are all called to be disciples, and therefore we're all called to be disciple makers, right? And the reason why that matters is because of our understanding of discipleship. I think when you hear the word disciple, for most of you in the room, what do you think of? You think of 12 guys, right? You even probably thought of some of their names. Like, that's what it means to be a disciple. That's actually not what it means to be a disciple. Now, those guys are apostles, right? But they're not just disciples. Anyone that's a follower of Jesus is a disciple. It's not reserved for just those elite Christians or these 12 men to do, all right? So you must personally follow Jesus. Number two, 
a disciple grows in sanctification. I, I really wish that I had written this different, right? You guys update your notes in real time, right? What I wish I would have written is a disciple is one who continues to grow in sanctification, all right? So you just update your notes right there. A disciple is one who continues to grow in sanctification, right? We see this in Romans chapter 6, verses 20 through 23. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness, But what fruit were you getting at the time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we're talking about the ongoing process Right, the, the continual growth in sanctification for all believers. That's what a disciple uh, is. That's who they are. They're a person that continues to grow in their relationship with Jesus. Sanctification, remember, just a fancy way of saying uh, growing more and more like Jesus, right? Like the Bible tells us that you're being conformed into the image of his son, right? So you're, you're becoming more and more like Christ. That's a process of sanctification if you are a disciple you are continuously on that process this side of heaven, right? You're, you're going through it. So why is that important for us to understand? It's important for us to understand, number one, because discipleship, contrary to popular opinion, is not a class or a book or a curriculum that you go through, right? It, it, it's a lifelong process, It's an ongoing process of sanctification. That's what discipleship is. You don't get to a place where where you check that box, right? Like, I went through uh, this material one time, and so that means that I've been discipled, right? Like, like you you aren't done until heaven, okay? And so it's an ongoing process. And so the other reason why this matters so much is we need to be growing in our relationship with Christ if we want to be a good disciple maker. Why? Why? Because we can't take people to a place that we've never been ourselves, okay? It's very difficult for you, if not impossible, to be able to lead people to a place that you've never been yourself. And most of us, we feel more comfortable with leading in things that we're familiar with, right, than not. And so that's the idea here is that you can't You know, you can't take people to a place that you've not been yourself. So you need to be growing in your relationship with Jesus, in your understanding of Christ, so that you can continue to take others along with you. Uh, This week, Aaron and I, uh, we were, were, we can laugh now at the experience. It wasn't so funny earlier in the week. I took a couple days of PTO uh, to do some little projects around the house to get it ready for painting. And one of those projects is Aaron has been wanting a porch swing. And so I thought, we can knock that out. It'll take me half a day. I could build the swing, hang it. We'll be done super fast, right? Well, that was Monday morning. Tuesday afternoon, I'm still working on this project. And I don't know who built our house, but I want to meet this person one day. I hope that they're not still in the business, okay? Because, because listen, our, our mantra at home is nothing is simple. And I don't know why I can't, you know, just figure this out, but something that should be simple, like hanging a porch swing, big deal. Anyways, long story short, I'm in the middle of all this. It's, it, it's a real sanctification test, if you know what I mean. And so I'm busy. I can't stop what I'm doing, but I need to go to Home Depot to get stuff to cover it up. So I give Erin a list, and I send her. I write down all the stuff. So she goes to Home Depot, and I told her, if you have trouble finding it, just find somebody that works there, and they will be able to help you. All right? If you work at Home Depot, this is not meant to be offensive this morning. But that was horrible advice, right? So she gets to Home Depot. She shares with the guy that works at Home Depot, this is what I need. You know, I don't even know if, is that a thing? You know, yes, it's a thing, okay? So, so it's, it's so bad that now a customer is now helping Aaron figure all this out and the guy that works there figure it out. And, and in this process, at some point, the gentleman that works at the Home Depot looks at Aaron and the guy that works there and say, or the, the other guy that does not work there and says, do you guys know where this is at? <laughs> what? <laughs> Brother, you're wearing the Home Depot apron, right? Like you're the one that's supposed to work here. You're the one that's supposed to know this stuff. You're the one like, we, we were hoping that we can rely on you to help us in this process, Right? And that's what made it, it, made it so funny this week as we're thinking about this. Is like, listen, same thing's true for us, 
right? If we're going to take people and lead them and make other disciples, boy, we better, be, we better be doing some of this stuff on our own, right? We better be growing in our relationship with Christ so that we can take others along with us. You don't want to be in that situation where, like, you're supposed to be the one that knows. And, and by the way, how long do you get to be a Christian before we can expect that of you? 30, 40 years, like we, we have people that still won't pray out loud. I mean, it's this craziness stuff. Like you've got to begin to do this stuff and grow in your relationship so that you can take other people with you because if you're not confident in where you're going and in your own spiritual journey and process, you're never, ever going to step into leading somebody else in that. All right, so remember that. And disciple continues to grow in sanctification so that they can take people along with them in this process. If we're not, you can't take people to places you've never been. Number three, a disciple makes disciples who make disciples. This is, this is the whole idea is that you would make other disciples. Like, like the end goal, listen very closely, the end goal is not that you become a disciple and then you're done. If that was the case, we'd be, we'd be all flying up to heaven as soon as we gave our lives to Jesus, right? Why are we still here? We're still here because now I'm supposed to take what I know and my discipleship, and I'm supposed to go and make more disciples. This is God's idea, right? We don't, we don't get to decide this. This is God's process in doing this. So a disciple makes disciples who make disciples. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Now, in the context of 2 Timothy, we know that Paul's writing to young Timothy, and he's encouraging him to take what he knows, pass it on, so that it can be passed on. That is the process of discipleship, right? Look at verse 2. And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You see what Paul's trying to explain to Timothy? Like, listen, if, if you just stop, you become a disciple and you're done and you never pass this on, then the, then the, then the faith comes to a screeching halt. You, you've got to pass this down so that more people might come to saving faith, that more people would be discipled. You're a disciple who makes disciples that make disciples. It, it's an ongoing process that you're handing down, all right? And listen, we're, like I said, we're all disciple makers, all of us. It's our number one job description. God didn't call some of us in the room to make disciples and others not. We're all called to make disciples. And by the way, you are making disciples. In the most basic form of the definition, you are making disciples. How do I know that? Because your children and the people around you, man, they're looking and turning out just like you. Now, that up to you to decide if that's good or bad, right? But listen, in my house, here, here's how I know that discipleship happens even if it's not about the spiritual things, right? Like in my house, I've got little kids walking around the other day, one's yelling boomer, and the other one on the other side of the house is yelling sooner. Why does that happen? Because we made disciples, right? Choose you this day. We serve the Lord, and we root for Oklahoma. Those are the two, like we made disciples. You make disciples in your home too, and, and you see it on full display, parents, grandparents in the room. Have you ever had that moment when like one of your kids does or says something and you're going, oh my gosh, I made a disciple. <laughs> they are, they're doing what I do. I remember that happened. One of the earliest memories I had was we're driving down the road one day. And let, let me just say, your pastor is sanctified through the driving process a lot, okay? And we're driving down the road one day and and I'm like, man, I wish this guy would just get out of my way. What, he has, my famous thing is he has nowhere to be, right? To which my young daughter in the back seat goes, let's ram him. <laughs> Disciple making. Not good, but effective. We are making Disciples. Okay, so when we think about this, disciples who make disciples who make disciples, right? Like the bigger question isn't are we making them, but are we making disciples of Jesus? That's the bigger question. Listen, when my kids stand before God one day, he will not give a rip about the Oklahoma Sooners. 
And he won't care about a lot of other things. His only concern will be, did you follow my son? And so am I making disciples of Jesus as much and as intentionally as I'm making disciples of my children, of all these other things? Right? And so that's the challenge for us. Disciple is a person who makes disciples who make disciples. So we've talked about what a disciple is. Let's, let's talk a little bit about how are we to make disciples. And here's the good news. God gave us the blueprint, all right? I love this about Scripture. We, God didn't just like, hey, figure it out. We'll see what they come up with, right? He gave us the blueprint. Now, we are guilty of that, adding a bunch of stuff in there that we think would be effective or, 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 or best, and we sometimes overlook the simplest thing that God has given us to do, right? Like as a church, like I said before, Awanas and Sunday school, all these are great things, right? But, but our number one job is to make disciples. And he, and he tells us how we're to go about that. Look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. By the way, this is what we call the Great Commission. From Jesus himself, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That's the command. That's the commission. All of us that are followers of Jesus have been commanded to go and make disciples of who? Of all the nations. In fact, the best translation for that is, is as you go. As you go, make disciples. That's the expectation. That doesn't mean you've got to go all the way around the world to make disciples. That means as you go. Wherever God's placed you and put you, you're to make disciples in those specific areas. But he goes on, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So three things real fast. How are we to make disciples? Well, he gives us three objectives in this blueprint for us to be disciple makers. Number one, we're to share the gospel. We're to share the gospel. We talked about evangelism a couple weeks ago. I don't want to confuse you, though, so let me tell you this. This is important that you understand this. Evangelism is discipleship. Evangelism is discipleship. It's all a part of the process of making disciples, right? For far too long within the church, we've held these in, in separate camps, right? Like, we evangelize, and then people come to saving faith, and then we disciple them. Listen, that's not even the biblical model, and that's not even how it works at your house, right? I didn't wait to disciple my children until they come to saving faith. They were discipled through the word and came to saving faith as a result. So evangelism is discipleship. Discipleship is evangelism, but we're to share the gospel. Number two, we are to baptize believers, Baptized believers. Why is this so important? What does this deal with baptism? We're going to talk at length about it next week, but just for our purposes this morning, we're to baptize believers because this is your public profession that you're a follower of Jesus. This is another thing that we've got it kind of mixed up and backwards, right? For most of us, we're thinking profession of faith and baptism, those are two separate things, right? My profession of faith was that Sunday morning that I walked the aisle at church. No, no, like, listen, your profession of faith is when you go public in your following of Christ. And the Bible teaches that that is baptism. So baptism is your public profession of faith. It's you in front of everybody saying, listen, I am a follower of Jesus. That's why it's so significant that you be baptized, and that's why it's so uh, good that we encourage people to be baptized. Listen, there were no like secret followers of Christ that weren't baptized. Like that, that's never encouraged in scripture. And before you throw the thief at the cross, I mean, listen, if he could have come down, he would have been baptized, I promise. Okay. So this is the idea. If you have come to saving faith and have never been baptized, you need to be baptized because that is your first act of obedience. And it is your public profession that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You can't remember Make disciples if you are not yourself a disciple. And people know who, who you belong to, right? Number three, we're to teach what God has commanded. Teach what God has commanded. We'll talk about here in a second for, in this practical section more about what that means. But you're simply to teach what God has commanded you. So take any heavy weight off yourself about 
happen to produce the most fantastic disciples in the world and save everybody. Listen, that's not your job. Your job is to share the gospel and leave the results up to the Lord. Your job is to encourage believers to be baptized and leave the results up to the Lord. And your job is to teach all that God has commanded, which is this, teach people God's word and leave the results up to the Lord. But that's your responsibility. That's how we're called to make disciples. So we've talked about what a disciple is, how to make disciples. Here's the big question for us this morning. What are ways that we can better make disciples? So, so, so if we're going to get our hands dirty in this and actually begin to, to make disciples, where, where do we need to start? What does that need to look like? Well, number one, we need to build relationships and look for others to disciple. First, first step in being intentional, right? I, identify the people that God's placed in your life. Who can I make disciples of? And remember, discipleship doesn't begin after somebody comes to saving faith. Oftentimes, discipleship starts before somebody comes to saving faith. That's what we're seeing in the church in Iran. It's flourishing right now. Why? Because they're starting with the word. And what did we, what did we hear the week that we talked about evangelism? How does somebody come to saving faith? By the word proclaimed. So we start with this discipleship relationship. So you need to be thinking about people and building relationships with others that you can disciple. So real practically under that, start with prayer. Just like with sharing our faith. God, give us boldness, give us courage, give us somebody. Show me somebody. Give me a name. Second of that, use discernment. Like we talked about before, who is it that you've placed in my life that I need to spend my time? Because listen, discipleship can be time-consuming it just can, and it's going to require a lot of commitment from you if you're going to do this. So you need to use discernment and make sure that you're discipling people who want to be discipled. Listen, you're not going to be able to force somebody into discipleship. I'm going to be able to kidnap them and duct tape them and just force feed them. No, that's not how it works, right? Next thing under there, begin with your circles of influence. Listen, you're probably not going to be super successful if, like, while you're pumping gas, you just met some dude for the very first time, and you're like, hey, man, you want to start a discipleship relationship? He's going to be like, no, I want to finish pumping my gas and go home. But begin with your circles of influence. So who are people that you work with, people that you live around in your neighborhood? Listen, for mom and daddies in the room and grandparents, start at home. My goodness, how in the world could we ever expect to disciple somebody outside of the faith if we are failing at discipling in the walls of our own house? Start there. Begin with your own children. Deuteronomy chapter 6 says that you are the primary disciple maker of your kid. Not Pastor Travis, not Pastor Brian, mom and dad. And you will be held accountable to God. Like I said, God's not going to care that all my kids knew Boomer sooner. He's going to know, what did you do to teach them to follow my son? Make disciples in your home. Start right there. All right, number two, understand your role in discipleship. We already hit this a little bit, but I want to make sure that we, we cover it again. First thing, share the gospel. Remember, what is the gospel? What are we sharing? You're sharing your sinful condition and that Christ's finished work on the cross has made a way for you to have forgiveness of that sin, Right? Encourage their public profession of baptism. Listen, as a church body, if you've got kids or family members or you're in Sunday school class with somebody that you know is a follower of Jesus, has never been baptized, you should be encouraging them to be baptized. Not force them, but encouraging them to be baptized. Next thing under there, teach them what you know. Teach them what you know. Listen, the pattern in the New Testament is people come to saving faith in Jesus and then they immediately go share the gospel and make disciples. How are they able to do that without understanding the whole Bible or without being in a Bible study or, or an apologetics course? How, how would I ever do this? You do this by teaching them what you already know, just like we talked about with evangelism, right, and, and, and sharing our faith. So same thing with discipleships. So tell them what you know. 
And I talk to people all the time about this. They're, they're terrified. They're scared to death. And it's normal. Even moms and dads, listen, this is hard. And it can be, it can feel daunting, right? You don't know where to start and you don't know what to do and you don't know how to teach your kids. Listen, simplify it for yourself. How would you teach your children to do anything else you know how to do? Dads, how, how did it work at your house when you learned how to change a tire? You know what didn't happen? My dad didn't go, hey boy, here's the manual of that car. Go change that tire. If you have any questions, I'll be right here. No, like what did he do? Like he took me outside and showed me. First he did it himself and let me observe and watch. And then he gave me small opportunities and jobs in the process to figure it out. And eventually I got to the place where I can do it by myself with him watching or not even there, right? Like that's teaching somebody how to do something. That, that's what we need to do with our faith. You, you just walk your kids through it. And here's the good news. Start simple. We have spent the last six weeks talking about the basics of the faith. It's why I wanted you to have these handouts because that's where I would encourage you to start. What am I gonna teach them? You're gonna teach them how to have a quiet time and be in God's word. You're gonna let them catch you doing it too, remember? You're gonna demonstrate it for them. What else are you gonna do? You're gonna teach them how to pray and more than just at dinner. Please don't do that. Like, We've got a bunch of kids who won't eat their first bite without praying, but yet they have no other prayer life. Why? Because that's all that's been demonstrated for them. You get together as a family and you get on your knees together and you throw up big things to God and you do it in front of them and you teach them how to do these things. Evangelism. Listen, do not outsource these opportunities, mom and dad. The first person that your children should see share the gospel with somebody who doesn't know Christ is you. Not a mission trip when they're an adult. It should be you with the waitress at the restaurant that you're about to leave and go to. But demonstrate these things for them. But start simple, the basics. Be in God's word, prayer and fasting, how to share your faith, stewardship and tithing. Listen, if you've never sat down with your children and explained to them, this is why we give, how much we give and how we've come up with that, then, then start there. You're just walking them through the process, but start simple and, and think about how you would teach them to do anything else, right? Maybe it's not a tire. Maybe it's baking a cake. Listen, what you do not want to do is just be like, hey, good luck on the cake, right? No, you start simple. You start small, and you go, listen, before I teach you how to bake a cake, I want to teach you how to crack an egg. We're going to get proficient at this thing, right? And then you're going to demonstrate it and walk it through, but it, just simplify it for yourself. Number three. And again, we're not going to be able to cover everything this morning. Like discipleship is a huge topic, but just a couple things to encourage you, to get you pointing in the right direction and get you going. Number three is this. Be patient and remain faithful. Be patient and remain faithful. Discipleship is a marathon, not a sprint. Like I said, it's like there, there is no past tense, right? You're not discipled. Check that box. No, it's an on going process, so you need to remember that as you bring other people along in the process, that they are the same, that they're on a journey, right? Because some weeks, they're going to be up here, and they'll be like, man, I just had an incredible week with the Lord, and then the next week, they're going to be down here, and they're going to be questioning things like, does God see, and does God know, and is God good? And then the week after that, they're good again. Same thing, they're gonna be in God's word five times and then the next week, they're gonna be in God's word no times. And like, that's what makes this so, so challenging, right? It's because you're walking with people through a process. So I want you to be uh, patient, remain faithful, remember that it's a marathon, not a sprint. And listen, especially for mom and dads in the room, focus more on the process than the outcome. Focus more on the process than the outcome. Listen, we all want our kids to be good, whatever that means. We all want our kids to, to grow up and want to go to church, right? We all want our kids to, to be in God's word. We all want these things for our children, and we focus so much on the outcome that we forgot about the process, right? And, it, and it's the process that's the bread and butter. It's the daily process and the daily grind that they're in with you, right? 
So focus more on the process and less on the outcome. Because if you focus on the outcome, you could miss the process. But listen, if you focus on the process, you will have an outcome. Discipleship will, will have its work, right? And so that's, that's what I want to challenge us with this morning. Again, this isn't, this isn't everything to do with discipleship. But listen, we are called to make disciples. It's our number one job. And so that's what I want us to think about this morning is where do we begin where do we start? If we're already doing it, how do we get a little bit better at it, more proficient? If we're not doing it at all, let, let's get started this week, and let's start right where God's placed us, right? And for most of us in this room, it needs to start at home with the kids that God has entrusted to us, right? Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your word and your challenge to us, God. We thank you, God, that we even have the opportunity to be a disciple. God, that we're no longer stuck in a hopeless situation, God, dead in our sins on a crash course to hell, Lord. But Lord, you provided us a way to have forgiveness of sin and a relationship with you. And so thank you that we can be a disciple. But God, I pray now that you'd help us to understand that that wasn't the end goal for us to just become a disciple and then hang back and relax until heaven one day. But God, what you've called us to do is be a disciple who makes disciples who make disciples. So God, give us courage and boldness. Give us discernment. Give us a desire to want to see people uh, disciple. And God, I pray that this week we would begin the good work. God, at the very least, that this is the one thing that we're doing. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.